So thanks for having me. Um, and, uh, and I love you all. Um, I was, uh, my thoughts were here with you in Portland. So I want you to write an excellent programming blog. Um, the title is in an imperative mood for a reason, because I want you to do it. And I'm asking you to do it. We're here because we're interested in contributing to the open source community. And I want you to do that by writing. Um, and not just code, but also words. Why? So there are, I think, three kind of overall reasons why it's great for you to write and why I want you to do it. Um, first of all, writing is thinking. And it's not just normal thinking, like sitting around thinking. Writing is super-powered thinking. And I think that writing is, so you know that like, there's no test of your understanding so great as trying to explain some topic to somebody else. And in words, explaining something to somebody is a great test. But when you're writing an explanation of a topic, it's even better. And some of the reasons are we don't get real-time feedback. Um, and that makes it extra challenging. And so if you're able to write an explanation that you know will work, even without having somebody nodding and saying, yes, yes, if you can just throw an explanation out into the ether in writing and believe in it, then it's really good. And you really understand what you've explained. Another reason why a written explanation is a really great way to prove your understanding is that um, you have the time to go over it again and again, to reread it as you're writing. And it really consolidates your understanding over the course of that process, over spending days writing down an explanation of a topic. And the final thing is, if you're explaining something to somebody in person and you say, well, wait, actually, that bit confuses me. Um, you might skip over it. You might not come back. You might not really go back and learn the topic again. But if you're writing, you can put the essay on hold and go off for hours or days, refreshing and deepening your understanding of a topic, and then finally come back. You might spend weeks writing something really deeply, asking questions of experts. And when you've finally finished the thing, you understand it better than any other topic in your life. Um, I've found this repeatedly. My kind of strongest and freshest understandings of any topic, so the things that I've written long articles about. Um, and the time that, my, uh, that I really need that superpower the most is when I hit a gross bug. So when I know that I'm going to need help thinking, I start writing. Um, so this is my blog. And I'm sorry, it's a little bit narcissistic, but I'm going to show you pictures of my blog. Um, besides narcissism, the other problem right now is that I'm showing you a bunch of text and I'm trying to talk to you. Uh, so you want to read, but please don't, because I'm going to share links to every article that I'm discussing today at the end. So you don't need to read it now. You can listen. You can read later. So this is an article that I started writing when I hit this awful bug. So I work on PyMongo, which is the Python driver for MongoDB. There's lots of stuff in there with like concurrency and thread locals in Python. And um, those aspects of the Python language have changed a lot over the history of Python. Um, and when I hit a bug in there, I knew I was going to need help, because I knew it was just going to be hairy and really hard for me to understand. So long before I had a thing to explain, I started writing an explanation. I knew it would be wrong. But I knew that over the course of drafting this article, I would consolidate each step of diagnosing and then fixing the bug and be able to kind of get my thoughts outside of myself, examine them, determine whether I was correct, and then move to the next step. And this process allowed me to, first of all, come up with a blog post that I think is very interesting. Um, and also to diagnose and solve this really gross bug over the course of about a day and a half of work, something that I'm sure would have cost me 
weeks of work if I hadn't been able to think as systematically as writing allowed me to do. So writing is thinking. That's one reason why you should write. That's why it's good for you to write. Uh, another reason that you should write is that you're a specialist. Um, and I say confidently that you're a specialist because, first of all, everybody's a specialist in something. Even if you're an assembly line worker, even if you're doing something that everybody else does, you know something unique about how to do that. But none of us is an assembly line worker, right? If you're working in open source, there's no reason to do something that's already been done. If it's already been done, you just use it. So whatever it is that you're working on is your unique specialty. You are one of a handful of people in the world who knows best how to do whatever it is that you are working on now or whatever it is that you have worked on. So I need you to share that knowledge so that I can find it when I need it. And being a specialist means that you don't have to be elite in order to have something worth sharing. Right? If everybody knows the same stuff, then there's one expert who knows it best. But since we're all specialists, you don't have to be elite. Each of us knows something among the best of any of us, if that makes sense. So you can express that expertise in code, but expressing it in human language is a little bit more efficient, a little easier to Google. Please share it so that I can find it when I need it. And the final reason why to write is that since you're a specialist, you have a community of fellow experts in your field. And the narrower it is, the more important it is for you to find each other. Uh, so like I said, I work on this driver. Connection pooling is a big issue for me. And uh, one day I got an email out of the blue from this guy whose name is uh, Wouter Bolsterly. And with a name like that, I knew that it would probably be a fun conversation. And I was right. So Wouter Bolsterly wanted to write a driver for HBase, which is a, another NoSQL data store. And he knew that I had written a Python driver for MongoDB. And so he wanted to ask my advice um, about connection pooling in his Python driver for HBase. So we had this great email conversation. He was asking me the things that I know better than almost anybody else, right? The little tiny part of the world where I am the expert. And so in a very efficient way, I was able to guide him off some of the mistakes that I'd made in the past, guide him towards some of the details that I'd learned through hard and unenjoyable effort. Um, and he was able to make this driver, which uh, is really quite popular. It's downloaded almost 1,000 times a day. And I was able to contribute to this thing that a lot of people find really valuable. And I contributed very efficiently. I didn't have to write any code. Um, I'm not credited anywhere. I'm not, my name is not in the GitHub repo, but you know, I'm not in it for credit. Uh, I'm in it to make a contribution. And being known as an expert, because I had written about connection pooling for MongoDB in Python, thanks allowed me to very efficiently find a fellow specialist in this field and make a contribution to a very valuable project. So I hope that I've convinced you why you should write. You should write because it helps you think, because it helps you share your narrow expertise, because it helps you find other specialists in your community. So what should you write? Um, I'm going to start with a quote that's kind of the thesis statement. There's this guy named Seth Godin, who's uh, a former, I think he was a marketing executive for Yahoo back in the day. But despite that, he's very smart. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and he says, most of the time, you'll aim to delight the masses, and you'll fail. So much easier to aim for the smallest possible audience, not the largest to build long-term value among a trusted, delighted tribe to create work that matters and stands the test of time. So in my opinion, that is the, what we should all be going for. We should go for very narrowly specialized 
writing that appeals to people who are working in your particular field. And rather than being newsworthy, to write articles that matter and provide value for a long period. That's my opinion. This whole talk is opinion, all right? Uh, when I give programming talks, I try to back them up with facts. This is just my experience and my opinions. If you disagree with me, you're probably right. But in my opinion, this is the kind of thing you should write. Um, my favorite writers, uh, I've read many dozens of articles to kind of think about what I want to talk about today. And things generally seem to fall into about five categories of kinds of things that people write. People write stories of things that happen to them. They write opinions that are uh, reasonable and not ad hominem and backed up by reasonable arguments. Um, of course, among programming blogs, how-tos are one of the dominant forms, as well as investigations of how things work, internal implementations. And the final thing is there are tons of reviews of technical books, of coding projects, um, as well as non-technical books, movies, video games, things that people enjoyed. Um, so you can, if you're trying to decide what to write, or if you know a topic that you want to address, but you're looking for what format to address it in, you can start among these five and kind of think, maybe I should write a how-to. So I'm going to talk about each of these five and give an example of one of my favorite articles that was written in each of these five formats. And again, at the end, I'm going to share a link that will um, give you many more examples for each of these five than the one of each that I'm talking about today. So a story. Uh, the structure of a story is very simple. I'm going to tell you a story about Fu. He taught me bar. It led to this other thing. First this happened, and then that happened, and that's the story of Fu. Um, you know what everybody loves? Everybody loves an outage report. When, uh, when there's a big outage, I'm always like thirsty for the report. It might take a while to come out, um, but it usually does. And I think that the writers feel this sort of sense of like responsibility to be transparent with their users. But um, I think the real, the, the real value of an outage report is is the, the drama. There's like tragedy, there's idiocy, there's triumph over adversity, there's like late nights and lost revenue. Outreach reports are, are the best. Um, it, it reminds me of, um, you know, after the Challenger exploded, the sort of famous moment when Feynman dips an O-ring into ice water and it cracks. Like, there's that dumb error at the, at the heart of every outage report. And we're all sort of waiting to find out, like, what was it? Um, besides outage reports, uh, conference recaps. Um, if you're just looking for a story to write, um, you came here. Uh, think about what happened. Um, that'll be useful to you. Uh, I think that writing down what you learned, remembering people's names, remembering your favorite stuff is useful. Um, and it's a story that a lot of people uh, might want to hear. Like, after I came here last year, I met a couple of people who really kind of touched me with their generosity um, or were just particularly strange people or particularly interesting people. Um, so I wrote a little recap. Um, and I think that a lot of people, my colleagues in New York, enjoyed reading that um, and kind of got a flavor of what it had been like for me here. And, uh, thought about whether they might want to come here next year. So that's a story you could write. One of my favorite stories um, is by a guy named Glyph Lefkowitz. Uh, Glyph is the author of Twisted, a Python web framework. And this, uh, this blog post, Unyielding, um, it's very long. It's very good. It's mostly actually an opinion piece. It's about why multi-threading is too hard to get right, and why you should do async instead in Python. But within this opinion piece, he embeds a story about a bug that he had encountered when he was writing a uh, massively multiplayer um, text adventure game many years ago using multi-threaded Java. Um, 
He writes about this multi-threading bug that he experienced. He said, one feature of the game was a brass mechanical cockroach, which would crawl around on a timer, leaping out of a player's hands if it was in their inventory, moving between rooms if not. In the multi-threaded version, the cockroach would leap out of your hands, but then also stay in your hands. <laughs> As the cockroach moved between rooms, it would create shadow copies of itself, slowly but inexorably creating a cockroach apocalypse. <laughs> As tens of thousands of pointers to the cockroach, each somehow acquiring their own timer, scuttled their way into every player's inventory dozens of times. Given that the feeling that this particular narrative feature was supposed to inspire was eccentric whimsy and not existential terror, <laughs> the non-determinism introduced by threads was a serious problem. Um, so stories are great. Uh, stories are how, so if you're writing about programming, um, it can be boring. And we're all inherently interested in stories, stories about people. Um, stories are how you make an emotional connection with the reader. And so stories are a useful tool. You can either just write a story or, as in this case, you can embed a story within any of the other five, four kinds of things. In this case, it's an opinion, but it's backed up by a story in order to give you an emotional connection with his argument. His argument is, multi-threading is too hard. The story is frightening and it's to frighten you off of multi-threading. So that's the first what of five stories. Second is opinions. Um, the structure of an opinion, we learned it in high school or college mostly. Uh, you present the thesis of your opinion. You present points of evidence that support your opinion. You head off likely objections, and then you just restate the thesis, and that's how you conclude. Um, the most important thing about an opinion piece is uh, not just to have an opinion, but to have a compelling reason why this opinion is correct. And the other thing to keep in mind is um, no ad hominem, not against people, not against software either. Uh, if you don't like Node, if you think that MySQL is better than Postgres, I think you should keep it to yourself, because I don't think that that's a very useful thing to write. Um, if you have a more detailed opinion, like MySQL is better at this than Postgres is, because I tried it and I found out this technical reason why I think that that is the correct opinion, that's useful and your readers will find that useful. If you just think that Postgres is a piece of crap, keep it to yourself, because Hundreds of people are devoting their lives to that product. Um, and millions of people find it useful. And if you just think it's crap, there's probably something that you don't understand and you need to keep looking. Uh, as Mr. Miyagi says, karate is for defense only. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, a really great um, opinion article that I read recently is by Julia Evans. Um, she's a Python programmer in, um, actually I'm not sure where she is. I think she's in Canada somewhere. In Montreal. Montreal, yeah. Uh, she wrote this great article about how you don't need to feel guilty for not contributing to open source. And she has this really interesting argument that um, if you are not currently either running into a bug or missing a feature in an open source library, then making a contribution may not be relevant to you right now. You don't have a personal itch to scratch by contributing to open source. And so if you just go out looking for a contribution to make that's not directly relevant to you, then you will not feel inspired and you may not even implement the correct thing because you are not personally using the thing that you're trying to write. And so she says, it's fine, give it a rest, be a consumer. Um, the time will come again when you will have an itch to scratch, and that will be the right time for you to make the contribution. So this is a great opinion. It's interesting. It includes uh, sort of more context about her idea. It doesn't hurt anybody, and she has a reasonable argument to support her thesis. So this is the kind of thing that I try to emulate when I write an opinion. So the third what 
is how to, how to do something. Doing foo is important under the following circumstances, right? You need to start out by motivating the person who is reading your how to. Why should he or she find out how to do something? And then readers to whom this is not relevant won't waste time reading the rest. And people who didn't know that they needed to know how to do something will be motivated to read to the end. After that, you say you're going to show how to do foo. You do this, and then you do that. You offer the steps. There, I've shown you how to do foo, and now you should go out and do it. Um, very straightforward. There's a nice example of this. Uh, it's by Kenneth Reitz. He's a Python programmer who is the author of Requests, one of the most successful and popular and admired open source projects. Um, he wrote about uh, what he's learned by growing this project as its benevolent dictator, how to maintain control while still uh, being very responsive to people's needs and not burning out. And he starts out with a story, again. Um, to create an emotional connection with you, he talks about an open source SDK that Facebook released, which uh, started to break, and Facebook didn't respond to people's complaints, and the project died. And he uses this story to create an emotional connection with you. You don't want this to happen to your project. Here, I'm going to show you how to make the, sure that your project grows. Um, another important thing to note about this, it's small, but essays is the directory of this URL. He doesn't call this a blog post, right? A web log is a news feed. And you, my dear specialist open source coders, are not writing a news feed. You are writing articles or essays that have long-term value for people who are in your field of specialty. And so you are not writing blog posts. A blog post is ephemeral. Its worth declines rapidly after it's been published. You are writing essays and articles. Those are valuable things. You come back. You correct them. People use them for decades. Um, so I want you to start thinking of these things that you write as essays, just like he did. So that is the third what. The fourth out of five is how something works. Hey, do you wonder how foo works? I'm going to tell you how foo is implemented. It does this. It does that. There, I've shown you how it works. Um, this is not motivated the way that how-to is motivated. This is not, like how-to is engineering, and this is science. This is knowledge for knowledge's sake. And in my opinion, I don't think that you need to motivate it. Some people will read your How Something Works article because they think that by knowing how it works, they might be able to use it better. And that's a fine reason. But then there are also people like me and like probably a lot of you, who just want to know how everything works. Um, and I think that that is the audience for these kinds of essays. So you can say you should learn how it works so you can use it better. But I think that the, the sheer delight of digging into things and seeing how their gears fit together is sufficient motivation. And if somebody isn't interested in that, then he or she won't read it. That's fine. Um, favorite recent example of this is by Allison Kaptur, a Python programmer in New York. She wrote about syntax warnings and symbol tables in the Python interpreter. So she'd been teaching some beginning Python programmers how to code. And somebody had done something that no experienced Python programmer would do, which is to say import star within a function. And Allison discovered that there's a very strange syntax warning that arises out of that. Um, and an experienced Python programmer would never hit this. So it's not a very useful 
thing to know about why this syntax warning occurs. But she dug into it anyway because she just wants to know everything that there is to know about Python. And she found that there are aspects of this warning that touch on the Python compiler, which is not something we talk about very often, um, as well as the bytecode interpreter and the uh, symbol lookup table. Um, and it's just interesting. If you want to know everything about the Python interpreter, this is an interesting post. And if you don't, then it isn't, and that's fine. So the fifth what is reviews. Uh, and I'm going to talk for a little bit about this because I think that there's sort of a lot of, in my opinion, mistakes that you can make. So the structure is I read, I saw a movie, I played a video game, I used something. This is what it is. This was my experience of it. The thing has these strengths and these weaknesses. And in conclusion, it's best when evaluated by certain criteria. So the, um, the human tendency when reviewing something is to say, this was good or this was bad. This is three out of five stars. And that is almost useless, right? Even for restaurants, but especially for books and software packages and movies, um, the good bad axis is attractive but uh, useless. What I want you to tell me about the thing is what it is, right? Because that is, um, I, I'm probably not going to read it myself. So you telling me what it is is useful for me. You summarize it. Um, and then you tell me uh, what you thought of it, how you experienced it. You know, I was frightened, I found it useful, I had a bug, whatever it was. Um, and then you tell me not whether it's good or bad, but what it's good for. This project is good for X. This game is good when you're looking to spend three days straight playing a role-playing game. This movie is good for a date, right? So don't just tell me where it sits in your personal idealistic good, bad axis. Tell me, tell me details and tell me when I should use it, when I should watch it, when I should play it, all right? And again, no ad hominem. No, this thing sucks, all right? Um, most of the time, if you don't like it, don't even mention it at all. Uh, one of the reviews that I wrote that I'm most proud of is this one. Um, and since this is a wall of text that I don't want you to read, I'm going to blur it. <laughs> uh, so this is an O'Reilly book about MongoDB and Node. Um, and I promise this is the last blog post of mine that I'll show you. Um, and uh, so it's within my expertise that I know a lot about MongoDB because I work there. Um, and it's also out of my expertise because I'm not a node programmer. Um, but I do know about async, but I know about it in Python. So I was able to write about my experience. If you know the things that I know, and if you're ignorant about the things about which I'm ignorant, then the book might seem like this to you. And these are the topics that the book covers. This is for whom I think it's probably most useful. Uh, there are a couple of grievous errors that I think that the author is making, and here are my arguments about why that's so. And then here are the, a few of the awesome things that the author is telling me about, and here's why I think that they're awesome. And in conclusion, if you're this kind of person, then you might want to read this book, but watch out for these things which I think are mistakes. And that's your review. And I think that that is very, very useful to a large number of readers. Whereas if I'd said, this book is bad, that would be worthless. So those are the five what's. Um, and you can use these if you either uh, don't know what to write. You can ask yourself, do I have a story to tell? Did I read something recently that I could write about? Um, and if you do know what you want to write about, but you're not sure what format, Again, you can look at these and say, well, maybe I can structure it as an opinion. 
And now I have a set structure that I can start to plug the bits of my thinking into. Um, the final thing before we move on from the what's is uh, reviews are great if you just want to practice your writing, but you don't have like a discovery to describe right now. Um, we're always experiencing things that other people have produced for a reason. You know, something with some sort of artistic intent. And so you have an opportunity to review it. And I think that describing what a thing is in writing is a great way to just flex your writing muscle. Um, so if you don't have anything to write right now, uh, reviewing is like a kata that you can practice that will um, keep you in shape. So why, what, who is going to read what you write? How do you find an audience? Um, that Seth Godin quote, I think, uh, that I started with um, could, could be repeated here. Write for the smallest possible audience. Delight the smallest possible tribe. Um, create long-term value. And so that means that it's not about reach. It doesn't matter how many people read what you wrote. It only matters who reads it. And whom you are trying to reach are experts, specialists in your field, your community. Not the largest number of people possible, but the people with whom communicating is the most valuable for you. And for them, the people for whom your writing is worth the most. And that means it's not about SEO. SEO is about competing. It's about ranking higher than your competition for common search terms. But your specialist writing uh, is not going to be found through common search terms. So if you're an expert in like training a cat to care for a Tamagotchi, uh, or um, estimating the weight of a banana based on its length and, and color, uh, using computer vision. Um, these are not common search terms, and so if somebody is searching for those things, they will find you. And so you don't need to compete with the other Tamagotchi cat trainers out there. All right? You have a narrow specialty, and they will find you. You don't need to worry about SEO. It's a waste of time, and it sort of feels gross. Um, so when experts are pulling your writing to them, they'll find you. Uh, what about when you're going to them? Um, you can find your experts easily. They are hanging out in the planets. So there's like a planet Python, planet Ruby. These are aggregators. They pull your RSS feed from your blog and aggregate it with other RSS feeds. And then the specialists in your field are subscribed to the planet's RSS feeds. RSS is alive and well here. Programmers, many of them are obsessive about RSS. So uh, don't think that RSS is dead and that you need to go to Twitter. RSS is kicking um, in your specialty. Uh, same with subreddits, right? Hacker news, nobody serious hangs out there anyway. But um, the main problem with hacker news is that it's general. Who is hacker news for? The Python subreddit is for Python programmers. So when you write about Python, you can post your blog there, and you will find your specialists there. A um, little more about planets, just because they're, at least for me, they're the main way to reach my community. Um, so this is Planet Python. It's an RSS aggregator as well as a web page. Um, every time I post Something about Python, uh, it's aggregated here, and I automatically get about 1,000 reads um, with no effort, because there are many, many thousands of Python programmers reading this. Uh, same for Planet Mongo. We started that. Um, oh, sorry, that's the wrong Mongo. Uh, Planet MongoDB, right, is where we, I thought that was going to be funnier. OK. Um, <laughs> Flash Gordon, guys. All right, um, Planet MongoDB is something that my company set up. Uh, if you want, if you're writing about MongoDB, they aggregate you here. Um, aggregators are administered by people, 
you email them when you want to be included in the aggregator. The polite thing to do is to create a category feed within your blog of things that are specifically relevant to this aggregator, and then ask the administrator to include that feed in the Planet's overall feed. So Planet's aggregators, subreddits, um, these will find you the experts that you're looking for, and you don't need to make much additional effort to find them. Um, besides that, a lot of people, because they think they're writing blogs, uh, the home page is just the most recent blog post, or a list of the most recent blog posts. But you're not a newspaper, right? You're writing articles of lasting value. So I think that you need a static home page that shows maybe a few of the most recent things that you've written, but also your best writing. So that when somebody goes to you.com, they see your, the things of which you're most proud, right? That's what you want to show. Your most recent work is ephemeral. Show people the things that you're most proud of. Consider it your, like, mantle. Uh, and besides that, write. Like, don't waste your time trying to reach lots of people. You're not BuzzFeed. It doesn't matter. Um, the people who want to read what you're writing will find you. Spend your time writing it so that they'll come. All right? So that's who, now how. Uh, probably a lot of you came here to, to cause you're, you want to figure out how to improve your writing. Um, and uh, to be honest, I'm a little weak here. I don't have great advice. Write, practice. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, Find the, the articles that you love the most. Uh, what has been the most valuable to you? Which specialists in your field have um, written the things that you wrote over and over, that you read over and over again, that, that you love the most, that were the most interesting and valuable to you, and emulate that. Think about what is it that you loved so much about that article or that uh, made it so useful for you and try to emulate those qualities in your own writing and practice. Um, don't emulate famous bloggers that you don't like or who aren't specialists in your field. You know, Daring Fireball, um, uh, Mark, uh, what's his name, Gruder, Gruber. Um, great writer, um, but he's not a specialist in your field. He's, a, he's an Apple industry analyst. He's famous, he makes a lot of money off of writing, but um, don't emulate him because you're not like him, right? You're writing about your thing. You're writing about Tamagotchi. Find your favorite Tamagotchi writer and emulate that person. So the final thing is, now that we've sort of sketched out how, is when. I don't have time to write. How do I make the time for writing? Um, the reason why people think that they don't have time to write is that they think that they need to be posting constantly because they think that they're writing blogs. But you're not. You don't need to write frequently. You don't need to write regularly. You're writing things that will be very deep, probably fairly long, and will provide value for a very long time, for years, maybe for decades. So. In that context, it doesn't matter if you haven't updated your blog in a week, right? If you're a celebrity and people are following you, you write often so that they have a connection. If you make money from writing, like TechCrunch, then you post regularly in order to generate revenue. But that's not you. You're writing specialist articles that will have lasting value. So if you don't have time to write, don't. Eventually, there will come a time when something will inspire you. You'll have read something that you alone can see the problem with. You'll have used something that other specialists in your field will want to know about. You'll have discovered a bug or figured out how something works, and the specialists in your field will want to know what you've found out, and you'll be moved to write. So write then. And you might be so busy that you have to put it off. You 
take down some notes and you write it later. Or it might take you weeks of Sundays to write it. And again, that's fine. Because once it's out there, it will continue to generate value for people for many, many years. So if you don't have time to write, don't worry about it. Not having time to write is a symptom of having the wrong priorities. Uh, this um, content marketing expert sounds like a really boring kind of person, but he wrote a great thing. His name is Patrick McKenzie, and he said uh, that you can and should make the strategic decision that you'll primarily write things which retain their value. It takes approximately the same amount of work to create great writing which lasts versus creating great writing which ages quickly. Right? So if you prioritize writing things which will create value over a long period, then you can use the time that you spend writing very efficiently. Writing news is inefficient because you have to do it all the time and it doesn't last. Writing one thing which lasts for many people, right, which like one person visits every day for a decade, that's valuable and that doesn't cost you very much time to write. And if you have nothing to write right now, if you don't have any time to write, write short things, right? If you just, if you're like me and you do kind of need to write periodically in order to keep the muscle flexed for the moment when inspiration hits, write short things. Write a review that only lasts for a paragraph, right? You can think about it while you're jogging and then by the time you actually sit down to write it, it takes 20 minutes. Um, that'll kind of keep you in shape. It doesn't need to be exhaustive. And then when you discover the thing that was going to require you 10 pages to describe, you'll be ready to go. So here is the promised link. Um, that will take you to my blog where I wrote about this talk about writing blogs. And it will have links to all of the things that I screenshotted and a dozen other um, very useful articles that I really admired, um, as well as writing about writing that was most inspiring to me. Thanks. Thank you.